डॉक्टर इमरे बंगा जी से मैं निवेदन करता हूं कि आप अपनी बातें हम लोगों के सामने रखें मैंने सोचा था कि आज मैं हिंदी या उर्दू में बोलूंगा और एक पावर पॉइंट प्रेजेंटेशन भी तैयार किया था लेकिन यह हुआ था कि मेरा जो पेन ड्राइव है उसमें एक वायरस आ गया है तो प्रेजेंटेशन नहीं कर पाऊंगा और मेरे सामने जो लिखा हुआ पेपर है वो इंग्लिश में है तो मैं भी अभी इसी पेपर से कुछ इंग्लिश में पढ़ूंगा सबसे पहले मैं यह कहना चाहता हूँ कि मेरे लिए यह बड़ी खुशी की बात है कि मैं हैदराबाद में हिंदी और उर्दू के बारे में बोल सकता हूँ क्योंकि यह हिंदी और हिंदी और उर्दू की शुरुआत एक तरफ से तो यहाँ गोलकुंडा से ही हुआ हुई है और दूसरी बात है कि यहाँ मेरे मुझसे पहले बहुत सारे विद्वान इस विषय पर काम करते रहते थे तो मुझे जरा सा जरा सा अजीब लगता है कि मैं विदेशी होकर अभी हिंदी और उर्दू के बारे में बात करूं लेकिन मैं फिर भी साहस लेता हूं कि इस विषय पर मैं कुछ बताऊं और यह कहना तो ज़रूरी है कि मेरा जो काम है वो यहाँ के दो बड़े विद, बड़े विद्वानों के काम पर आधारित है सैदा जफ़र और ज्ञानचंद जैन ने जो तारीख है अदब उर्दू सत्रह सौ तक पाँच खंडों में एक बहुत अच्छा उर्दू साहित्य का इतिहास लिखा है तो मुझे उसी उन्हीं पांच खंडों से बहुत सामग्री मिली है फिर भी मेरी दृष्टिकोण अपना है बाहर का है तो उन लोगों से कुछ अलग है और शायद मैं कुछ नई बातें भी कह सकूँगा सो so, Now I switch to English and uh, we'll read a few passages in uh, English um, about uh, <coughs> uh, the shared early history of Hindi and Urdu. Um, this is a paper that is going to be present, uh, that is going to be included into a volume which is in print or maybe is already out. Um, that's a volume edited by uh, uh, Francesca Orsini of uh, London University, and the title is Before the Divide. The book release will be on the 16th of January. But it might be uh, already available in Delhi. I haven't got a copy yet, so I am uh, just uh, reading from a, um, a printout. So, in one of my um, Urdu classes, a student was puzzled by a short poem inserted into an Urdu prose, prose narrative. The poem had hardly any Perso Arabic vocabulary, but was written in the Urdu script, as was the rest of the text. She complained that in spite of being a native speaker of Hindi who had learned U the Urdu script, she could not make out what the difference between Hindi and Urdu was. This uh, spontaneous eruption is in dramatic contrast with the political role the Hindi-Urdu divide played in the 20th century, uh, manifesting itself in sentences such as uh, <coughs> um, Abdul Haq stating that Pakistan was not created by Jinnah, nor was it created by Iqbal, it was Urdu that created Pakistan. Although since the 18th century, Hindi and Urdu have developed uh, two distinct literary traditions, the border lines between the two are far from uh, being as clear as the political boundaries. <coughs> um, the divide was blurred in certain intermediary literary genres, even in the late 19th century, um, and the example of the perplexed student shows that the uncertainty persists uh, till the present day. Instead of recognizing their common linguistic and literary heritage in a plethora of North Indian vernacular di dialects that from an outsider's point of view were simply called Hindavi, language of India, or Bhakha, simply language or vernacular, to distinguish it either from Persian and Arabic, so Hindavi is, uh, appears 
in Persian and Arabic sources, while in Sanskrit and Prakrit sources, Bhakha appears. Uh, this course is on their early literature evolved in uh, the two languages from the 18th century onwards that are mar marked by appropriation, neglect, and exclusion. So what do I mean by appropriation, neglect, and exclusion in the histories of Hindi and Urdu? While histories of early Hindi literature tend to be integrative, and uh, that's, I think, the key word, integrative, often including the borderlands of Upper Brancha, Maithili, Dakkani. Um, early Urdu literary histories either try to restrict themselves to the Kariboli dialect or to Muslim authors, making allowance for Muslim authors writing in Hindavi dialects other than Kariboli, such as those of the Avadhi Masnavi tradition, or more catholically, for Hindu authors who show some input from Kariboli. The latter approach is the one adopted by uh, Muhammad Hussein Azad's Ab e Hayat, published in 1880, to the most comprehensive recent history of early Urdu, Jain and Jafar, Tarikh e Abd Abe Urdu, Satra Sotak, which was published in 1998. Though this last work excludes the Avadhi Masnavis, the authors are well aware of the vagueness of their approach. They give up the idea of restriction to Muslim authors on the basis that authorship is an element external to the language and include poets central to the Hindi tradition such as Mirabai and Tulsi Das because of the Kariboli features of uh, poems attributed to them. However, they also admit that calling this poetry Urdu would render the Hindi-Urdu distinction meaningless and therefore hail approaches such as that of, uh, uh, that of uh, Sahil Bukhari, which examined the hin history of Kariboli literature in the Perso-Arabic and in the Devanagari scripts together, showing the overlap of Urdu and Hindi traditions. It is indeed the most suitable approach to investigate the early development of this idiom, all the more because the use of Kariboli is not closely linked to any writing system. Apart from the Perso-Arabic and the Devanagari scripts, Kariboli was also written in the Gurmukhi, uh, in the Kaiti, and also in the Gujarati scripts. <coughs> the most influential recent study to deal with the origins of modern Hindi and Urdu um, is independent of the work of uh, Jafar and, uh, uh, and Jain. That's uh, Shamsur Rahman Faruqi's uh, English book, Early Urdu Literary Culture and History, published in 2001, which is a close English reworking of his Urduka Ibtidai Zamana, published in 1999. Farooq's view of Urdu literary history is also exclusivist, and early Urdu literary culture appears limited to Kariboli literature by Muslim authors. In opposition to this, is the general and official Hindi stand emphasizing the composite aspect of Hindi, uh, which encompasses a surfeite of dialects such as Avadhi, Bhojpuri, Brajbhasha, Rajasthani, Kariboli, and even others. This view is expressed in English in Amrit Wright's A House Divided, The Origin and Development of Hindi and Urdu in 1984 which in turn was based uh, on Suniti Kumar Chatterjee's ideas uh, described in Indo-Aryan and Hindi in 1942. Uh, Amrit Rai, son, Amrit Rai's examples are taken from both Hindi and Muslim authors. So basically what I want to say is that the Hindi approach to what Hindi lit literature is is that everything that can be called Hindi will be Hindi, while the Urdu approach is much more a kind of purist approach that we have uh, either just Muslim authors or just Kariboli, and sometimes uh, the Urdu literary history is uh, taken some cases from the borderlines. While Hindi is very happy to include anything that is in the borderline or even more. Uh, <coughs> the polemic is well illustrated in the search for the earliest poet. While Chatterjee and Rai trace the development of early Hindi from Brajbhasha, uh, from Upper Brancha, and consider Goraknath and the Nathpanthis, followed by Amir Khusro, to be the first Hindi authors, Faruqi suggests that Urdu literature began with Mas'ud Saad Salman in the 
uh, 11th century in Lahore, and he is followed by Amir Husro. Both speculations are problematic, however. No Goraknath manuscript is available prior to the late 17th century, and the uh, oral transmission just changes poems and uh, uh, puts in the names of new authors, especially well-known authors' names, into less-known authors' works. Um, similarly, the earliest quote from Khusrau's Hindavi is in the Sabras of Vajahi of Golconda, written in 1636. So we don't have anything written in Hindavi uh, by Amir Khusrau, which is written down in manuscript form prior to 1636, and that is from Golconda. Faruqi himself points to the fact that nothing of Masood and Khusrau's Hindavi corpus is available today. That's uh, just the uh, uh, scholarly integrity of Shamsur Rahman Faruqi that he claims Udu to, uh, to be so early, but he also admits that nothing survives. Um, <coughs> and the first person, and Faruqi says, the first person whose Hindavi survives in substantial quantity and with whom Urdu literature can seriously be said to begin is an author not from the north, but from Gujarat, namely Shaykh Bahauddin Bajan, whose dates, again, uh, not really scholarly dates, but uh, it is 1388 to 1506. Um, now, uh, most uh, of the scholars uh, are very dubious about uh, lives, uh, lives that last 420 years. Although in the Middle Ages, quite a lot of poets are credited with these uh, long lives. But these are uh, rather uh, speculations uh, for various reasons. Um, <coughs> so Bajan was from Ahmadabad. Um, also, if one looks at the volumes of, uh, uh, of Gyanchan Jain and Saida Jafar, one would find that uh, most of the early poets of uh, Hindavi in the north uh, are problematic. Now, a fundamental difficulty in writing the early history of Hindavi is the lack of philological background uh, work to the text studied. Even when we have critical editions based on manuscripts, we cannot be sure that the text in a later manuscript represents the early linguistic situation as at the time of its composition. One cannot state with certainty that the text of the critical edition of works like the Bikat Kahani, that's a major work from the north from the 17th century, and is claimed to be the first major work in, um, uh, in Urdu in North India. So this Bikat Kahani, based on manuscripts dating from at least 100 years after the death of the author, corresponds to the language uh, of its birth in the early 17th century. As we are going to see, traditional attributions to early authors found in relatively late handwritten books are far from reliable since, since it was common in early modern South Asia to link poems to the prestige of established names. This is very important that if you have a poem, you can link it to the prestige of established names. This is why there are thousands of poems under the name of Kabir, for example, although uh, Kabir might have written only a few hundred. And the same is the case with Mirabai, whom uh, about 5,000 poets, uh, poems uh, are credited, although uh, in 17th century there are only six poems that are found in manuscripts. A similar case is with Surdas on the Hindi side. Um, the undependability on manuscript transmission is only one of the many problems. An immense part of early Hindavi literature still lies unpublished in manuscript collections, and the picture that we can get on the basis of the published material is bound to be distorted. The published material is more often than not available in publications whose principles are far from that of a critical edition. The editors often standardize not only the orthography, but also the language. Studies on early literature often give examples without specifying their sources, and in this way, the reliability of their quotes is uncertain. 
This paper aims to follow up the emergence of Kariboli literature in North India by a search for works in early dated manuscripts, first of all, and by using this material as a point of reference in language and style, poems with less reliable transmission can be examined. In this way, I will present the traditional attributions to 16th and 17th century poets when the styles of the individual works are consistent with the other works found in dated manuscripts. A philological approach, a work with manuscripts, is by definition restrictive since it cannot take into consideration the rich oral tradition that is almost impossible to document today. Already Amir Khusro mentions that he has composed poems in Hindavi and there must be other Indo-Persian poets who also did so. This Hindavi poetry, however, did not initially enjoy much prestige and was probably never committed to writing. And writing means prestige. Only languages of prestige were committed to writing. So in the early years of, uh, uh, of the Muslims in India, the languages of prestige for the Muslims were uh, Persian and Arabic. And Amir Khusro didn't uh, think that his Hindi was prestigious enough to be written down. The same was true about Hindus, that they thought uh, Sanskrit and upper branch or Prakrit to be languages of prestige, and uh, they didn't want to write down so much uh, Hindi or uh, any other Bhasha works. There is an excellent study about the so-called vernacularization, the emergence of the local languages uh, by an American professor called Sheldon Pollock. And uh, his book appeared about two or three uh, years ago and he shows that the first uh, uh, vernaculars appeared rather in South India and vernacularization appeared much later in the North. Um, <clears throat> now, let me just uh, say that I'm going to talk mostly about uh, Hindavi in the North, not about Dakani, of which I'm not an expert, and uh, the history of Dakani is uh, much better documented than I can uh, uh, add anything to it. Um, um, claims to the beginnings. There was a race to show, both on the Hindi side, that no, Hindi poetry was the first, and in the Urdu side, no, Urdu poetry was the first. Um, so the Hindi side said that it was upper branch of poetry with which Hindi started already in the sixth or seventh century. And they would quote examples in which uh, you would say, uh, for example, that's um, an upper branch uh, uh, work by Hema Chandra called Shabdanu Shasana, Bhalla hua jo maria bahini mahara kantu. Bhalla hua ki margaya behen mahara kant, mera kant. Lakta hai Hindi hai, ya Urdu jo bhi hai. Um, this is, uh, however, within uh, an upper branch of work. And uh, this is rather a coincidence because most of the other parts of this upper branch of work are just uh, completely incomprehensible for Hindi speakers. For example, the second line of this uh, couplet is Lajje Jantu. Uh, yeah, yeah Lajje Jantu Vayansiyahu uh, Jai Bhagya Gharu Ent. I mean, those who are familiar with it uh, will know the meaning, but anyone who is not uh, familiar with it will not guess uh, what it is simply by knowing Hindi or Urdu. So this is upper brancha, and in a way, upper brancha is a different language from Hindi, but it was, uh, it was included, especially at the time of uh, Ramchan Shukla and at the time of the freedom struggle, to show Hindi as a very strong national language with a very long history but uh, somehow overcoming the linguistic divide. Um, <clears throat> now, um, let me just uh, show another claim for the beginning. Well, nothing of Salman Saad Masood of Lahore survives. Uh, there is a mention uh, that he wrote in Hindavi, but Hindavi in early um, Persian writing in the 12th and 13th century didn't mean uh, Hindi or Urdu, Hindavi simply, or Hindui, simply meant the language of India. And it could be even Sanskrit or, uh, or Upper Brancha or Punjabi, we don't know. Simply, when I am, in a, when I am abroad, and uh, many people are not familiar with India, 
So I am asked, do you speak Indian? Well, uh, yes, I do. <laughs> but uh, this is a stupid question because there is no language as Indian. So Hindavi in the 12th century Muslim usage could be anything Indian, as the root suggests. Now, another claim, uh, Amir Khusro. Now, this should be um, examined a bit more in detail. Uh, for example, let me just quote, um, um, well, probably the most, uh, uh, most famous Hindavi work of Amir Khusro, and most of you must be familiar with it, um, is a Rechta, half in, um, uh, he's uh, attributed with several Rechtas, half in Hindavi, half in uh, Persian. Uh, for example, Zihale Miskin Makunta Raful, Durai Nena, Banai Batia, Kitab Hijran, Nadara Mejan, Nalehu Kahe, Lagai Chatia. So the first half is uh, in Persian, the second half is in, uh, uh, in Hindavi, mainly Braj Bhasha like uh, uh, features. Um, um, also, there is a Tahallus in it, Bahakke An Ruz, Bahakke An Ruz, Mahshar. This is a very, very famous rechta and uh, uh, also a favorite of, uh, of singers. Um, and it is very beautiful. But there is a problem um, uh, with it, and I will uh, return to this later. Um, also, there are similar claims. Uh, for other poets to be precursors of Kariboli and of Rechta literatures by 13th to 15th century Sufis, such as uh, Baba Farid or Farid's son-in-law, Ali, Ali Ahmad Sabir Kaleri or Kalyari, Sheikh uh, Kalyari, yeah, Sheikh uh, Hamiduddin Nagori, Ali Kalandar uh, Panipati, uh, Sheikh Sharfuddin Maneri, and others. And there are also candidates for early Rechta and Kariboli with Hindu background as well, such as the 14th century poet saint of Maharashtra, Namdev. And uh, there is, for example, a pod in uh, Namdev's Padavali um, uh, using Persian vocabulary, Uttam Naratan Upayari Bhai Gafila Kyonhu Vadivane Ju, and things like this. However, in the absence of early evidence, such as manuscripts or dated references, the attribution and the dating of all these poems are problematic. Um, the problematic nature of these attributions has already been uh, acknowledged by, uh, uh, by uh, uh, Saida Jafar and uh, Gyanchand uh, uh, Jain. And uh, these poems may not reflect the linguistic situation of the time of their putative authors. To illustrate the pitfalls of traditional attributions, let us have a closer look at the most famous of these um, examples, namely the Rechta of Amir Khusro. As has been mentioned, no manuscript evidence for his Hindavi exists prior to the quotes in Vajahi's uh, Sabras in 1636. The Rechta, quoted above, first emerges, emerged as Khusro's in the album of Partab Singh, copied in 1719. Since then, the poem appeared in Tazkiraz under the name of Khusro. The same Rechta, however, is also present in an earlier album, a Bayaz, dated um, uh, to 1652 or 1656, which was in possession of Mahmud Khan, Mahmud Khan Shirani, a great uh, uh, scholar of Urdu. And this is Shirani th uh, that I am now quoting and uh, his research. Here, however, in Shirani's early bayaz, the Tahallus, the pen name inserted into the last but one line, is not of Khosro, but of a certain Jafar, about whom nothing is known. Bamihre ansoch, charch ebad mihr, kibur de mara, shikebe Jafar. So it seems that this poem was written by a poet called Jafar. No one knows anything about him, and somehow. Uh, it became attributed to Amir Khusro, and in later time it ran under the name of Amir Khusro. This is Mahmoud Shehrani's conclusion. Uh, moreover, Shehrani demonstrated that the 16 moray form of its meter, called Mutakarib Fu'ulu Filun Shanzda Harukni, was not used before the mid 15th century. Nevertheless, we need not to be over-skeptical and should also take into consideration that the language of Delhi, Dekhlavi, 
was already used and understood by literati during the Sultanate period. It is also possible that we there were poems in a Kariboli template circulated orally, but are lost today. Since by the early 16th century, Deklavi had become the vehicle of Sufis of Gujarat and was cultivated in the cults of Deccan and uh, Gujarat as a literary language. Kariboli elements were also current in the mixed language of the Nirgun sons, as attested, for example, in the vocabulary of the Guru Granth Sahib where verbal and pronominal forms such as kia, gaya, muj, tuj, muje, tuje, tumara, tumari, tumari, etc. figure in abundance. The search for mixed Hindavi Persian rechta and for kariboli features shows that most early claims link, link rechta with Muslims rather than with Hindus and raising the expectation that the use of kariboli and of rechta was more closely linked to Muslims. But can anything at all be known about the Hindavi that Muslims used during the Sultanate period? After all, the dialect of the Hindavi romances was Avadhi ever since Maulana Daud's Chandayan. References to the use of Hindavi as well as Hindavi phrases and sometimes even poems are embedded into Persian works, such as letters or the discourses Malfuzat of leading Sufis delivered to a select gathering of disciples and visitors. These discourses were embellished with didactic poetry, anecdotes, and apophthegms. In the absence of early Hindavi manuscripts, it is in the works of the Malfuzad genre that a systematic and critical search can reveal the earliest recorded occurrences of Hindavi poetry. Although pieces of this genre may date from centuries after the death of the peer, some of them are reliable sources of information about the times of the spiritual master. Some Malfuzat were discourses recorded soon after they were delivered by a spiritual master, and some were collected by a descendant or disciple of a Sufi after his death. The most important source for early Hindavi is the Surur Sudur, which belongs to the second category. It contains the sayings of Shaykh Hamiduddin Nagori, the successor of Khaja, uh, uh, of Khaja uh, Muinuddin Ajmeri, as recorded by his grandson and successor, Shaykh Fariduddin bin Abdul Aziz, who died in 1334. What is attested in works from the 14th century onwards is that Sufis and other musicians used Hindavi in their musical gatherings in the north. It is documented that Hindavi was used. Um, there are references of the use of Hindavi but not so much uh, quotations apart from uh, kind of uh, words, uh, exclamations, bhaiya, and uh, uh, very short uh, phrases. A spiritual discourse of Nizamuddin Aulia, dated from 1316, tells us how the weaver, Shaykh Ahmad Nah uh, Nahravani, became the disciple, Nahravani, became uh, the disciple uh, of Faqih Madho, the Imam of the Jami Masjid at Ajmer, who had been entranced by Nahravani's uh, uh, Hindavi song and said to him that it was unfortunate that he was w just wasting his melodious voice in singing Hindavi songs and advised him to memorize the Quran. So in a way, Hindavi was not considered to be worth uh, being singing or not of the same height as uh, memorizing the Quran. That is, uh, that goes without uh, further explanation, but it also su suggests uh, um, uh, Nizamuddin's attitude towards uh, Hindavi. That, um, <coughs> the Hindavi of this poem um, um, is what later became called Vrajbhasha. The instance warns us that the Hindavi favored by North Indian Sufis in their gatherings may have been closer to Vrajbhasha than to Kariboli and Rekhta. Now, in the 16th century, Rekta seems to have been practiced both in Sufi circles and in the Mughal court. Uh, from Babur's evidence below and the existence of Rekta attributed to uh, other 16th century Persian poets such as Sakka, Muayyid, and Mashhadi, one can argue that the earliest Rekta writing may coincide with the beginning of Mughal times. One might even suspect that the poems attributed to Husro and to other poets mentioned above date from this century. 
prior to the early 18th century, prior to the early 18th century success of Wally's Divan, however, no serious effort was made to record a Rechta poetry in the north. The lack of manuscripts is indicative of the neglect of poetry that had not found its way into larger composition and also suggests that the use of Rechta must not have been very widespread or that it may have been an oral genre considered too frivolous or undignified for committing uh, to writing. An important pre-Mughal religious uh, lineage that used Rekta is uh, that of uh, Miran Sayyid Muhammad from Janpur. Um, <coughs> but I just uh, skip uh, his example uh, because he is uh, much more connected to Gujarat and Gujri and not so much uh, to the north. <coughs> 